Good afternoon. Uh, it'll be a bit more uh, demanding on you than, than the previous presentations. I, I'm going to uh, skip through some things uh, really, really quickly to try and show you uh, what, what we've got in the country, but, but a bit more on, on what we've been trying to do. So uh, how we've tried to understand South Africa's inequality um, and, uh, and what still needs to be done. So I'm motivating South Africa as part of this giant's project. I'm not sure we're a giant. Uh, certainly a giant of inequality. So in that sense, we, uh, uh, we belong in the project. Um, on that note, I, I could say that uh, this, this picture of three densities uh, is as, as close as I get to, to profiling South Africa's inequality. Um, and uh, although you wouldn't know, uh, it profiles a very high inequality country with a Gini coefficient in income terms, and, and the analysis is in income, uh, of around 0.67. So it's not quite at the 0.74 that Francois was talking about, that he's never seen before, luckily. Um, but uh, is extremely high and has remained resiliently high over the post-apartheid period, even in a climate in which uh, we've had between 2 to 3 percent stable growth over, over quite a long time, since 1994. But, uh, and so poverty has come down a bit, uh, as you may or may not be able to see in, in these distributions. Uh, 1993 was a survey that was done on the, on the sort of advent of the post-apartheid era. <coughs> And you can see that the, that the densities move to the right at the bottom. Uh, but they also move to the right at the top with some interesting movements in the middle. So, so it's an it's a intriguing uh, picture about inequality. Um, and so how have we understood this? We've got a resilient, high inequality in the country in income terms. In non-money metric terms, it's been a, a much different story, actually. And so I, I took this out of some work that's been done on multidimensional poverty, but it just shows on various dimensions, uh, again using household survey data, improvements from 1993 to 2010. Mm -hmm on a number of dimensions. Uh, the, the, the dark blue bars are 1993, the lighter gray ones are 2010, and you can see that uh, these are deprivations, so being smaller is good. Okay, and you can see huge improvements in nutrition, mortality, years of education, enrollments, water, sanitation, fuel, electricity, assets. And indeed, we've done, we've done some theoretical work. It's quite hard to turn those, those uh, multiple deprivation indices into inequality measures. Uh, we've done some work on that. And uh, what this shows, using some Lorenz curves of, of an asset index, <laughs> is huge improvements in inequality on the asset side. So income inequality is resiliently high. <coughs> Uh, asset inequality, largely through delivery from the state, has improved greatly. Uh, here's a slightly different take. It looks at different income components and their importance across the distribution and how that's changed over time in South Africa. So I've got income deciles at the bottom here, uh, 1 to 10. Uh, in 1993, and then it's the share of income going to households at different uh, levels of the, different deciles and how they've changed over time. So just for example, if you look at the, at the bottom decile in 1993, uh, labor income is providing 30% of, of household per capita income, uh, then huge income from remittances. If you know anything about the economic history of South Africa with its migrant labor, that's that's not unexpected. Uh, some income from government transfers, which is social grants, and then other 
And that changes dramatically as you move up the distribution. You can see that, that the labor market plays an absolutely central role in the incomes at the top end, and remittances less and cash transfers less. But it's the change that's fascinating here. Uh, in particular, you can see two things. I'd like to draw your attention to two things. One is the contribution of the labor market at the very bottom. It's been uh, a problem in South Africa, uh, especially in terms of rising levels of unemployment, but even in the quality of, of wage income going to the bottom deciles. Two is this massive triangle here, which is the extensive rollout of social grants in the post-apartheid system. And so you can see how important they are at the bottom end of the income distribution. So again, that's been a state-led initiative um, but this time, that's changed incomes, not just assets. So, how do we push on with that? I've only given you a snippet. There's much more to talk about, I'm sure. Uh, but what are the stories that, that people have put together to, to explain all of this? Well, there's some, there's some macro stories about, well, growth. Two, two to three percent is just not enough. We've got a sort of a target five to six percent uh, growth rate that m many of the macro simulations have, have speculated is what we need on a sustained basis for growth to start and employment creation to really take off in the country. Uh, I'm flagging that as, as an area in which very little work has been done, actually. And uh, to, to mesh with Francois' story about how South Africa is integrated into the world economy, over this period of, of fundamental change, as we saw. Also, very underdeveloped. And then there's, there's a range of other more micro-based things on which we have pushed on a bit, but there's much more work that needs to be done and we'll be doing under the giants. Uh, about social grants, labor market failures, uh, returns to, to uh, state expenditures and returns to education. Uh, I really want to, to, to flick through these, use them as indicative and just talk to them quickly. So we've done enough work on South African education system to show that the, uh, what's happened in South African schooling and education is that the returns to everything below complete secondary have collapsed. Very much like a skills twist in, in the US labor market, for example, but uh, from complete secondary up, the returns uh, complete secondary have been pretty constant, above that have risen dramatically. And that's been a source of, of drive, that's driven inequality in earnings and employment in the South African labor market. But we need to do more to link that formally into understanding changes in the earnings distribution. We've done quite a lot of simulation work to try and work out, okay, what has the impact of social grants been on inequality? I don't even try to process that, that slide. Take my word for it, it makes, it makes two points, that we, we find a mildly uh, improving effect of social grants on, on inequality. We find a disequalizing effect of the labor market. And these are, these are some of the techniques coming out of Latin America, particularly Ricardo Paz de Barros uh, and Chico and others. Um, demography counts too and needs to be considered in these simulations. Okay, what about the state? What about uh, the, the role of government expenditures? I've spoken about the cash transfers being massive. Well, have they had an impact? Well, we've been involved in a lovely project uh, with Nora Lustig. Uh, Ingrid Woolard, my colleague, is the, is the principal South African on that. Um, and really the question is, does the fiscal system decrease inequality? And it's a precise methodology that uh, Nora's developed and we apply in South Africa, uh, the fiscal incidence analysis. Um, and really, you mesh household survey data with, um, with administrative data, with how government is actually allocating its budget, uh, how much they're spending, etc., to try and see whether expenditures are appropriately allocated. A few quick graphs. This is, about, this is about the tax system. First, there's a Lorenz curve. 
uh, of market income shows you how South Africa is extremely high in equality in market income, right? So uh, then this is, the, this is the concentration curve. So the, the, the tax distribution, income tax paid by, uh, organized by deciles. And you can see that, uh, that the, the upper deciles pay from, from about there, pay nearly all of the tax. Well, that makes sense in a sense because they, they're earning all of the income. But this is, the, this is, so it's progressive in a sense, but what does progressive mean when you've got an inequality like South Africa's got? That's the issue that gets raised by, by this graph because this uh, space here implies um, that, there, that there isn't much room for, for it to have a huge impact on, uh, on inequality. And in fact, we find uh, that the, the redistributive impact is less so than in other countries. So this is a, a particular index located internationally and shows that we don't do particularly well. Now that's a consequence of our extreme inequality. But we do much better when you start feeding in uh, to whom the social expenditures are targeted. And so uh, the, the careful work that was done by this team uh, first takes the, uh, this then is the tax impact and it's, it's pretty small. Um, the direct taxes, then if you move to, to uh, the transfers, you add in the social transfers. This is a big jump that the actual state grants add. There's a child support grant, there's an old age pension. It has a big impact. Then if you add the indirect taxes, it, uh, it, it's actually mildly disequalizing again. Um, and then, uh, but then if you price in the actual value of the services going to education, health, etc., again, it's strongly redistributive. So it's an interesting story. Uh, and it makes a big difference to the Gini coefficient. If you, that's what this diagram does. But there's a fallacy that's perpetrated in South Africa a lot where uh, a big favorite of the policy community in particular who say, okay, this is really our Gini coefficient, 0.59, rather than the, the, this, is, uh, this is really the one that we were measuring before, actually. That's the standard measure that you, that you measure. Uh, well, and so South Africa is not so unequal as it looks. Well, you've got to compare apples with apples. So if you want to take this particular inequality measure, which does show that the state has a redistributive effect, well, you've got to benchmark it against um, other countries that, that do the same. So here we've got a, a, the, a flagging of the fact that actually South Africa does have a very <coughs> active um, change in the Gini as a result of its policies. Uh, but actually, if you benchmark against the countries, for example, apples with apples. So if you wanted to start with Brazil, which is the purple line here, that's where you start. And you can see that they are different in their texture and it's worth understanding those differences. This is well worth understanding. But then you must compare that genie to, to that genie over there. Okay, I, I have to stop. So where are we going? with this. Well, there's much more work. These are, these are broad findings at, at the sort of aggregate level that one needs to probe. Um, the one area where we're, we're going is in this top incomes issue. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're linking in in a collaboration with the South African Revenue Services uh, to merge in, as uh, Francois was talking about, uh, the, the data from the tax side with the household survey data to try and see whether the top end uh, can be improved. We have a 20% sample of assessed taxpayers. As Francois was indicated, it's indicating it's not that easy to merge in, but there's some, uh, some promising results at the outset. Uh, what did we, we looked at some um, top income of tax units, okay, for individuals 15 plus, um, and, and looking at these income cutoffs at the very top end of the income distribution and matching that, uh, matching the income and expenditure survey of the, of the state with, um, with the income cutoff from SARS. 
And you can see it's very promising up to a point. It's intriguing. This 253 uh, purchasing power parity dollars and 249 is very close. That shows a very close match. But then right up at the top, it shows that there's something there, something worth interrogating and the perfect advertorial, if you like, for, uh, for this project with the giants. Thank you. Thank you.